Okay. Well, let's jump on in here. And today we are going to study the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen? You know, this is, a, this is an amazing study because Jesus was given the full measure of the Spirit with no limit. Let's look at that in John chapter 3, verse 34. John chapter 3, verse 34. And the Bible says, For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for it is not by measure that he gives the Spirit. You know, right here, we see that the Bible says Jesus had the full measure of the Spirit. And there are three measures of the Holy Spirit that we're going to talk about here today. The first is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is the, the Holy Spirit that we talk about when we talk about baptism. Go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's beautiful. You know, I come to find in the religious world, most people believe in getting baptized. But most people also do not believe that you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at baptism. And that, that is the point in time when you are saved. And, and so when the Bible says, if you believe you will be saved, you always see the, the baptism come after that. They don't associate the believing with baptism. Most people agree that if you believe, it means you're going to repent. But most people in the religious world right now don't believe that believing means you go and get baptized right then and there. And you're, you make a decision to repent. You understand the elementary teachings. You have faith in Jesus, who he is, what he did for you, but also the life he's calling you to live. Therefore, you have saving faith. And when you get baptized, that's when your, that's when your faith puts you in contact with the blood of Jesus you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and you come out of the water, a pure vessel, the Spirit rushes in you. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Now, there's another measure of the Holy Spirit, at uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at that in Acts 2. We're going to read all of Acts 2 and all of Acts 10. Amen? Amen. Awesome. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews, from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then, then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? So that's gonna, we're going to talk about this more in the, in the Miraculous Gifts of the Holy Spirit study. He says, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans as Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Well, amazed and perplexed, they, they asked, well, what, is this, what does this mean? Some of them, however, made fun of them and said, ah, they had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice. See, that's what we got to do when we preach the word, brothers and sisters. And address the crowd. The crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men aren't drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. 
I will show wonders and in the heaven above and signs on the earth below of blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, they, so what's going to happen on the day of Pentecost is this scripture, this prophecy was going to come true. That those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that interesting? That when this prophecy is being fulfilled, it's not just a prayer and an acknowledgement that, yeah, I'm, I'm asking God into my heart. I'm just saying a prayer and then I'm saved. It goes on here in verse 21. It says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Now David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, and my body will also live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died, was buried, and his tomb is there to this day. But he knew, but he was a prophet and knew that God had on oath promised him that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Some strong preaching they had back then. When the people heard this, just like we've got to stay, the place we got to stay at, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what do we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But promises for you and for all your children, for all are far off, for all the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message. What was his message? He was, this message was that those who would call on the name of the Lord, those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And this is what the fellowship looked like and should look like now in every one of our Bible talks. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer everyone all right you're everyone right everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles we'll cover that again in miraculous gifts all the believers were together they would not have had 102 people out of 153 filling out a first principles test on the elementary teachings that they say they live out every day all the believers were together, had everything in common. Guess what they would have all gotten on this quiz? They all would have got a three. <laughs> Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The first example... Of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now let's go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Come on, bro. Cornelius calls for Peter. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. 
He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Wow. So what does it mean to fear God? That you're, that you're, that you're a helpful, generous person and that you pray to God regularly. On one day, at about three in the afternoon, oh, what was that? When he was praying, right? Because he was following the Jewish custom of praying about three in the afternoon. He had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius! Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. <laughs> now, send, now, now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who's called Peter. He is staying with Simon, the tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that happened and sent them to Joppa. Well, about noon, right, the following day, they were, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. Okay, what is this? They prayed at noon. They prayed at three. How often do you pray? You see what I mean? Oh, I had my, I had my 10 minute prayer this morning. That would be why the church has the problems that it has. That would be why your life may have the problems that it has. We don't just pray once a day early in the morning. We pray as needed throughout the day. We're not held to this at noon, three in, in the morning prayers, but we certainly should be praying far more than just once a day, guys. Amen? He became hungry and wanted something to eat. While the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and the birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Wow, Peter's really getting in touch here with the ushering in of the new covenant. You see what I'm saying? See, he had a cultural thing that would have warred against the kingdom and winning the world. And Jesus is converting Peter completely out of his old denomination, Judaism, and out of his cultural beliefs so that he can participate in the things that will make him relatable to the world. Verse 15, this happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back from heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the, God, the men sent, Cornelius, sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was speaking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come for Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. Now check this out, guys. This is so big, especially in our time right now. This guy, Cornelius, is a righteous, right? Now, you can be righteous and not saved. You see what I'm saying? You can be righteous and God-fearing and not be saved. You can be righteous, God-fearing, and respected by all the people in your denominational church. And you can still not be saved. You see what I mean? A holy angel told him, to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. What a man. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. 
Wow, what a man. You see what I mean? Both of these guys, what, what incredible dignity, nobility, and integrity both of these men had. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. See, guys, we got to pause right there. Here's, here's where we can go in air. Well, this is just how I was raised. This is just what I was taught. This is just what we do from my country. See, see, when we see the power of the scriptures, when we, when we confess Jesus is Lord, we must submit to the culture of the kingdom without raising any objection. He says, may I ask why you sent me? Cornelius answered, four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send a Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He's a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. <coughs> then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism wow now you gotta you gotta understand the power of this guys you got to understand the power of this that what's happening right here this guy's god-fearing he's a totally different race from peter he's got a totally different culture and yet he wants to know god and he's, and he's open to hearing everything the Lord had commanded Peter to say. See, we do have a racial problem in the church that, that we're even now continuing to baptize primarily those who are black. And, and we've really got to let this lesson in particular settle into our hearts. We are officially in what I'm calling the Project Lighthouse. And we have got to really go after this, guys. We can no longer just share only with who we're comfortable with. And I need to call you higher to share with more people. I'm not going to say stop sharing with people who are black, but we really all need to share with people who are black, Indian, white, Native American, Chinese, you name it. We've got to bring all the races from this city into our church. But it's going to take you like Peter, being in the spirit, getting the vision that God is trying to give all of us through the scriptures to save all the nations. And you can actually meet someone here who can be the father of faith for an entire nation of people. And yet, I don't know about you, but when we meet in person next week, I want people who come in to come in and even in the worldliness of people who are not saved and are not, not in the right relationship with God, for them to feel encouraged and not intimidated when they come in. You see what I mean? And we've got to get it. i got to beg of you, please get this conviction. Please get this conviction today of what our church needs. He says in verse 33, I now realize how true it is God does not show favoritism. At the minimum... We have to acknowledge that we have shown favoritism to only share with people who we're comfortable with. And it's time to come out of our comfort zones. It says in verse 34, but, but, but accepts men from every nation. So, so if we're not adding people from every nation, we really in our hearts don't accept people from every nation. And, and I know we want to, but it takes you growing in faith. I'm not, I'm not even saying it takes you being, not being a racist or whatever. We've been, in the, we've been in Zoom for a year, two years. We've been away, isolated. We've just got to grow in our faith today, amen? amen. And, and if racism applies, then please crucify it, amen. The church this large, somebody's got racist feelings and stuff, and amen. 
It's just a sin like everything else. But whatever applies, we've got to grow in our faith. He says, verse 35, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Do you see how Peter acknowledged what was good in Cornelius? He didn't just like come at him with all that he was wrong about in not being saved. He acknowledged what he believed. You know the message of God. He sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news. You know the good news. And so, and so you've got, we've got to learn to teach in a way that we never put down the sincerity of other people and what they believe. We've got to acknowledge the goodness of what they believe. He says, you know what has happened through Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil— because God was with it. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify he is the one whom God has appointed judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. See, the calling on his name by believing, right? Where is this going to go in the story? While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all who heard the message. All right. So the Holy Spirit came down on all of them, right? But were they saved because the Spirit came down on them? No more than it, when it came on Samson. No more when it came on Elijah. No more when it came on people in the Old Testament. See? The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even onto Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. What happened here? Peter passed the gifts on to them. That's what happened right there. You see what I mean? Peter gave them the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which enabled them to do the miraculous gifts that we're going to talk about in the next session. He says, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? He goes, okay, I baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You can now go do the miraculous gifts. But can anybody stop you from actually being baptized? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So what he's proving is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit can come on anybody. Then he's going to show them the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in baptism is what's coming. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Amen. Awesome. So that is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. It's not commanded, right? Let's go to Acts 1, verse 4 through 5. Acts 1, verses 4 through 5. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days he'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was predicted. It was prophesied about. It came without warning. People were not specifically praying for it. It, it. it caused them to be able to speak different languages. What was the purpose? The purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was to ushering the kingdom with power. That's what its purpose was. The purpose of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was to show that somebody had gone in the water with baptism as the pattern of how all disciples are supposed to help somebody be saved and come out with the power of the Holy Spirit from the indwelling in them. So these are the accounts of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Well, then it happened to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. It happened to the Gentiles beginning with Cornelius in Acts 10, right? And then note, note in verse 48 right there that we just read that Cornelius and his house were water baptized 
and saved at baptism. They first got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They got speaking in tongues. That was to prove to everybody that Gentiles could be saved. And then right after that, he goes, now watch how they can be saved. Bam! Baptizes them, and they get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You guys see how that works right there? Good, bro. Now, Peter explains these actions to the Jews in Acts 11. 1. Let's go there. Peter explains his actions. The apostles and brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of the Lord. So, when you hear that phrase, receive the word of the Lord, that meant that they found out about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which brings salvation, which comes because of salvation. And then it says in verse 1, So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him. Oh boy, trouble in the church. And said, You went into the house of an uncircumcised man, of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it happened. Well, I was in Jop, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and, and in a trance, as I saw a vision, I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. They're like, eh, they're unclean. That's what they're thinking, right? Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. See, I'm, he's like, he's appealing to them. I was like you. I'm like, no way. That's impure. You can't do that just like you're criticizing me right now. Nothing impure and clean has ever entered my mouth. See how obedient the Jews were? We got to really clue in on the value of the, of the Jewish culture. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. Oh my gosh. What, what three times? Three days? What did Peter do? He, he, he denied Jesus three times? Three days? You see what I mean? And then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. Now, let me just stop and say a little something here. I hear a lot of talk about the Spirit told me this, the Spirit told me that. See, the Spirit was actually telling Philip things. The Spirit was actually telling Peter things because they had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we cover in the Miraculous Gifts study. So let's just let it sit right there and keep that in your mind what that means, that he was being spoken to directly by the Spirit because he had the baptism of the Holy Spirit to do the miraculous gifts to continue ushering in the kingdom and giving the Jews faith. That's the only reason for it, and it died and it ended. So we've got to get a conviction about that. So these six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us, how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message throughout which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them and he had come on and had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord said to John, that the Lord said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So they experienced the same thing there that happened to the brothers on the day of Pentecost. He says, so if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, so then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Amen. Wow, that's some good stuff right there. Come on, bro. So, at the beginning, in Acts eleven fifteen refers to Jerusalem. So that was at the beginning when he was talking there. The message will save. See Acts eleven fourteen. Yet the baptism of the Holy Spirit came before P Peter finished preaching in Acts ten forty four. 
So does the baptism with the Holy Spirit still exist today? Well, let's go to Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Come on. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Amen? So that baptism exists today. There is one baptism, but with which? It was written about 60, 62 AD, right? There are three baptisms, right? John's baptism passed when the new covenant began in Acts 19, verse 1 through 5, right? Let's look at that. This is when John's baptism became invalid. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road to the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? <laughs> no. We've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So there were disciples. There were people running around teaching accurately about Jesus that, that were disciples, but they, they hadn't even heard there was a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. So he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that's Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, there's two works of the Holy Spirit. One to usher in the kingdom and the other to save a lost soul. You see what I mean? Same spirit, different works for different purposes. Amen? Amen. So John's baptism passed right there in Acts 19 when the new covenant began. The baptism with the Holy Spirit, Acts 2 and Acts 10, is no longer present. And it was a prophecy and a promise that has already been fulfilled. So no, nobody has the Spirit physically, literally speaking directly to them anymore or passing on the gifts or healing people or speaking in tongues. We get feelings in us and we feel like, wow, we get an understanding of something that we read, but there isn't a voice actually speaking to us. Does that make sense? It's called understanding. It was never a general command for all Christians. So baptism, and, and, and the truth of that is it came on Gentiles before they were baptized. So we know it's not a command for all Christians. Now, baptism with water in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of the sins to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's what all disciples are called to do in Matthew 28. Make a disciple, baptize that disciple, and teach them to obey everything I commanded you. Amen? So this is the baptism that is recorded all the way through the book of Acts and the epistles. So let's go to 1 Peter 3.1. Written about 64 AD. And this water, see, they, see, people say the baptism is a symbol. No, the water is a symbol, and this water symbolizes baptism, going under the water with saving faith. You see what I mean? So this water that symbolizes baptism now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body. It's not, a, it's not a physical thing. It can't be a work if it's not a physical thing, right? Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, <clears throat> and of course that's making reference to water baptism. And the Greek and Aramaic words match in full immersion into water. Amen? See, it had to be the one baptism of Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. It was the only one practiced by 60, 62 AD when Ephesians was written. And so, next, next, uh, the next class, which is going to be this Wednesday, is the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk all about the miraculous gifts and the healing and how all that went down and how it was received by the apostles laying on of hands. It's no longer present today. That is the baptism with the Holy Spirit study. And uh, I hope you guys are all encouraged. I hope you got deeper convictions. Now, I just want to share something with you as well. 
in my mind, I had that we were doing the Miraculous Gifts of the Holy Spirit study. I found out at 2.23 that we were doing this study. You see what I mean? Amen. And so all of this came just on the spot for me today to do this study. I didn't prepare for it at all. This is how we've got to be in our convictions. That's why I'm asking everyone, go up to the First Principles app, pay the $10, and listen to Kip teach you these studies again and again and again so that any moment in time you can be ready to teach this study on the spot with no notice. Amen, guys? I love you. Have a great afternoon and a great day. See you all on Wednesday. And then, and then the next time we'll see each other is in person at church on Sunday. Let me tell you what. Go up to, go up to the YouTube channel and listen to the songs and sing till you lose your voice so it's stronger for Sunday. Amen? All right. Love you guys. Have a great day.